So hello, Alan. How are you? I'm great. How are you two doing? Yeah, really well. Good. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for coming to chat. Yes. Yeah, we're happy so to be here. Before we get right into the topic, um, uh, let, let everyone know a little bit about you and, you and your role at Microba. Yeah, so I'm the senior scientist at Microba. And um, basically that means I'm really responsible for developing a lot of the science content that we put out there. So educational courses, informational material. I try to do keep it on top of all the research that's happening in the gut microbiome and really try to see where we can you know, leverage and use that research to help um, make our own gut microbiome analysis reports more informational for people and also how we can be translating that really exciting research to everyone out there so they can learn how important feeding your gut microbiome properly really is and all the amazing roles that our gut microbiome is doing for us. Yeah. Um, I've, I've done um, uh, the, the introductory course or the, you know, the, the insight training course and um, that was great and listened to some webinars. So yeah, you guys are doing a really great job of putting out some great usable info, like really great info for practitioners and, and for you know, the public as well. Yeah, really, wonderful. really thankful for that. I'm how long, glad to hear how that. Long, how long has Microba been around and, and, and how long have you been with them now? Yeah, so we're a relatively young company. So um, we officially became a company in early 2018 and we launched our first product, which is the Microba Insight Gut Microbiome Analysis in July of 2018. Um, however, we started, we came up with the idea for Microba years ago. Um, I actually started working um, at the University of Queensland at the Australian Centre for Ecogenomics and it's the founders, the founders of Microba are actually the directors of that laboratory at the University of Queensland. So they had the idea way back like in like 2013, 2014 that hey you know we have this amazing technology to be able to analyze microbial communities from almost any environment and we look at the gut microbiome, this is getting a lot of attention, but everyone's using outdated technology to assess it. And we can really make a difference in this field by applying our really cutting edge technology to this area. So that's what they decided to do. And um, I started working for them in 2015 and they kind of got me looped into this project of, you know, like how would we present information about the gut microbiome that would be useful for the general consumers? So, um, I was actually one of the founding members of the company, oh, cool. and so um, officially, I guess I've been with them since we launched, since we started the company in 2018, but I've been working on it in the background since 2015. Yeah, wow. Awesome. Very cool. And sort of, what gets you excited about this space? Like, have you always studied this type of thing, or have you uh, had a journey yourself and landed here? Obviously, they've, they've scouted and poached you <laughs> straight from the beginning. But, but pre that? Yeah, so I definitely have a bit of a convoluted journey to get here. Um, as you might have read, I think a recent ABC article said that, you know, typically people change their careers at least five times yeah. during their life. So um, I started out as a fisheries biologist where I was assessing the stress response in fish. Um, I was actually using a lot of the same molecular tools that we use right now. So I looked at gene expression and different genomics in fish. And then later I kind of switched careers from there to actually trying to um, educate the public and our policymakers about the latest science. And so I got this fellowship to work at the California legislature, basically helping inform policymakers about all the science that's influencing the policy decisions they make. And that really got me passionate for science communication and really being able to provide people with more of an unbiased view about the research that's out there. So I saw a lot of, you know, like lobbying companies out there really cherry picking the science. So people weren't really getting the full picture. And this is what I became passionate about. And so when I came to ACE at the University of Queensland, um, you know, Phil and Jean saw I've got this great molecular biology background, but I also have this really nice science communication background where I really try to be, you know, as objective as possible and really try to bring in all the research on a particular area and so that's what they decided to utilize in me. And so for the last four years now, I've been solely focused on the human gut microbiome and just immersing myself in that literature and this field. And it's, it's just been amazing. I have to say, this is, I feel like I've reached the pinnacle of where I wanted to be right now because this is something where, you know, you can 
really apply this knowledge to improve people's health. It's something where you feel like you can really make a big difference. And the research that's coming out in this area is just so compelling. Like it's really showing that it's actually quite simple for us to, to prevent disease and lead healthier, happier lives, you know, and it's just amazing to have the science to back all this up now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's and put that power back in the, the person's hands. It's like, yeah, you can influence your disease process. It's a lot to do with what's going into your mouth and into your gut. That's yeah. Exactly. Well, and, you, it's, and it's all stuff we've already known, you know, like we've known we need to have a healthy diet to be healthy, but nobody really understood why. And yeah, that's on that really deep why. level, eat your vegetables. Why? I hate vegetables. Well, <laughs> Yeah. Yes, the kids aren't going a, tra to tra this. a training video for children at dinner time would be awesome, Elena. If you can just work on that for us with your science communication, let's yeah do that one. <laughs> so you know what? It sounds like it's so simple uh, for us to to just to talk about and discuss that, but there is so many people struggling with it. Obviously, with the epidemic of you know diet related diseases and and stuff, it's just everywhere. So maybe it not is as simple as some, and I guess that we'll dive into this that uh, um, you know the topic of how can we, you know, cultivate, you know, uh, you know, we'll be healthy ourselves by com, com, uh, cultivating what's inside us and making that healthy. And Make our, our microbiome the foundation for a strong, healthy, you know, well-functioning human being. I guess it's a really, it's foundational, isn't it? And, I, and I'm, I'm going to start with the hottest topic because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's looking for the magic pill for a, a healthy metabolism or to lose weight and all that sort of stuff. In, in this area of expertise in the microbiome, does that have any impact on people's metabolism and, and, and uh, you know, I guess their weight loss effect from... Can, can our gut bugs be making us fatter or keeping us fat? Well, I'd have to say that it's hard to directly implicate specific gut bugs, but we do know that there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that can be influencing our metabolism and obesity. So we know that our gut bugs are producing all sorts of different substances um, when they're breaking down the different food components that reach them. Um, and so maybe just like a quick primer for everyone out there, you know, when we eat food, what usually happens is once it's, you know, meshed up in our stomach and gets passed to our small intestine, that's where the majority of the nutrients from the food we eat actually gets absorbed by our body. So like when we're eating things like protein and um, all sorts of different you know, fruits and vegetables, our body's going to take what they can out of that. But then a lot of those foods can't be completely absorbed by our small intestine. So they get passed to our colon. And so things that can't completely be digested by our body are things like fiber. Like when we eat um, a lot of fruits and vegetables and grains, um, there's components of that with these complex carbohydrates called fiber that our body doesn't have the proper enzymes to be able to break down. So that gets passed to our colon. Um, and a lot of times too, if we eat a lot of protein, that can't be, all be absorbed in our small intestines, that also gets passed to our colon. And then that's what's feeding our gut bugs. And so our gut bugs are actively breaking down that food that reaches them, and they're producing a huge array of different substances. And some of those substances have been shown to influence our metabolism and can perhaps even be influencing um, our weight. Um, if, if you don't mind me going on, I can give you a couple no, of no, Yeah. Um, everyone's going, don't stop, don't <laughs> stop. They're leaning in. <laughs> give me that magic pill. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a really exciting thing is we've been now finding that when our gut bugs break down these fiber rich sources like fruits and vegetables and whole grains, they're producing these really beneficial substances that are called short chain fatty acids. Um, and one of the most popular short chain fatty acids that has been getting a lot of attention in the media is called butyrate. Now we know that this particular substance called butyrate is actually really great at suppressing inflammation in our gut. It's also great at maintaining our gut cell barrier. And most importantly, it's been found that it can actually stimulate the production of what we call satiety hormones. So these are hormones that are actually telling our brain to stop eating because we're full. And we've also seen that other short chain fatty acids, um, there's ones called propionate and acetate, they also have the ability to stimulate the production of these satiety hormones. And so typically we see that when people are eating a diet that's rich in fiber, they're not going to be eating quite as much because they're getting those signals being generated in their gut that are telling their brain to stop eating. And they're also getting that great side-on effect of getting their gut, bar their gut barrier 
is staying intact and they're getting inflammation suppressed. And so we know that in obesity and a lot of metabolic disorders, it's kind of um, triggered or there's a, one of the low-lying causes is just chronic low-grade inflammation. And so if we can get more of those short-chain fatty acids being produced, not only are we stop, probably helping stop ourselves from overeating, but we're also helping suppress that inflammation, which can trigger further metabolic conditions. Yeah, wow, interesting. So, yeah, so uh, uh, bu burate. Butyrate, yeah. Butyrate. Yeah. Okay, so and I imagine with that some, something like that, it's there's uh, the lab, people in the labs, let's produce this stuff so we can get it in there. But obviously there's a, there's a whole process, like you sort of said, you know, the, the stomach is doing its part, the small intestine, and then, you know, the bacteria. And then I, I guess then there's certain bacteria that do it better than others. And i oh, just go, it'll, we could go down a rabbit hole, I'd imagine. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And that's the key is that though, when we eat more of those fiber rich sources, we start promoting the growth of those bacteria that are going to be producing the butyrate and the other short chain fatty acids for us. And so that's what's really great. And we do see that when we're not eating very much fiber, then those gut bacteria have to start looking for different fuel sources to survive. And so then they can often turn to things like protein or the mucus that's lining our gut. Some of them can even use bile acids as a fuel source. And when they start breaking down those types of food components, they can actually be producing substances that might actually exacerbate metabolic disease and make it work. Oh, okay, so that's interesting. So what you're saying is the one particular gut bug, he wants to survive, but if he's starving and he's not getting the stuff that he prefers, which is beneficial for us, he'll go for something else just to stay alive. But then the byproduct of what he eats then, he or she or it, I don't know. <laughs> um, it There's blue ones and pink ones. Detrimental, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly cool. right, and that's why it's really hard to actually classify gut bacteria as good or bad because most of the time it actually depends on what you're feeding the gut bacteria on whether or not they're going to be playing a beneficial role for your health or maybe. It's like you know, eating on a Saturday night, you know. If uh, if she's if she's not drinking, she's it's wonderful. But if she has a few <laughs> few drinks, she turns into something different. <laughs> okay. She's a lot more fun anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what about then um with uh the different you know the, the healthier people like looking healthier on the outside that the lean athletic body types versus the overweight you could then measure the t certain types of bacteria maybe but what are you seeing in your results from the testing that you're doing is there is there like some correlation between when you you know you're getting a um a sample back from someone who's suffering from uh, obesity or who struggles with, um, you know, the, a slow met metabolism that's conducive to weight gain versus someone who's effortlessly lean and has an athletic build. Are, are you seeing different microbial sort of patterns there or? So for our own database, we haven't really explored it that much yet in terms of the lean versus obese um, phenotype, but there have been studies that have been published on this. Um, and we do tend to see that like they've had studies on athletes and they do show that athletes do tend to have what we call a higher microbial diversity. So they have more different types of bacteria and they're more evenly distributed compared to people that don't actively exercise. And they've also shown that athletes tend to have a higher potential to produce those beneficial short chain fatty acids. And then on the contrary, when they've looked at um, obese patterns in obese people, they do tend to see that the microbial diversity is much lower. And that microbial diversity is actually a really important point because it has been linked with um, health. And so we do tend to see people that are healthier have the higher microbial diversity. And there are a few diseases that are basically one of their biomarkers is a low microbial diversity. And so that does seem to really be um, something that's important to be able to look at. And then with obese people as well, we do see, tend to see that there's a decreased potential to produce um, some of those beneficial short chain fatty acids. I think one recent large scale study showed a decreased potential to produce lactate um, and also the short chain fatty acid acetate. Oh, and interestingly, that study also found that they had a decreased potential to produce this really important enzyme it's a big word, it's called superoxide dismutase. Yeah, so wow. basically, Antioxidant, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, if superoxide is a free radical in our body, and so that's gonna be creating oxidative stress, but our gut bugs can produce an enzyme that'll actually basically degrade and break down that free radical so it doesn't cause problems in our body. 
but they did see in this really large scale study that people that were obese had a much lower potential of what fewer bacteria that can produce that enzyme compared to people that were not obese. Do we, do we have a rough count of the different strains? In the oh, it's, 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 it's so many. So right now, it depends if you're talking about species or strains as well. Strains. Strains. strains that's actually a tough one because we don't even have a good definition of that what a strain is. <laughs> so if, if, so, if we were talking in general, the large intestine may carry 500 strains, 5,000, 50,000. Like, is there a ballpark? Um, that is yet to be determined. Wow, okay. So the key is, is how far down do you want to go? So like when we do um, the type of sequencing, we do DNA sequencing um, of a stool sample. And when we do DNA sequencing, we can detect um, species of bacteria that are down to 0.05% relative abundance, which is quite wow. low. And we're detecting on average around 150 to 200 species of bacteria in the stool. However, there's a huge long tail of species that are present below that level. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, some people have estimated there could be as many as, you know, like a thousand species present in our intestine. It's just most of them are going to be at super low levels. And it's only when they start getting the appropriate fuel sources that they're going to come up in abundance. Is, yeah. is, it, is it kind of like, I would imagine it's like a, if you walk into a rainforest, you'll see quite a lot of one particular type of you know a few different types of trees and then you won't see all of these tiny little weeds and fungal things and like there's a lot of stuff that you may not see as dominating but there'll be a lot of sort of dominant species and then there'll be some other ones as well yeah okay. definitely and we do tend to see that you know the more evenly distributed so like people that have like a lot of bacteria that are kind of like at that maybe between one to five percent level you know, those are the ones that tend to have the higher diversity and tend to be more healthy compared to people that you don't want to have just like a couple really dominant species. Like sometimes we'll see people that have one species that's like over 20% relative abundance. Wow. Okay. Do you know how that happens? Is there a sort of, you know, what, what can lead to that? Yeah, so we have some ideas, um, things, patterns that we see that are pretty common in people that tend to have an overgrowth of a single species is that they tend to eat the same foods every day. And so eating basically the same types of foods means that you're only promoting the growth of bacteria that are really good at breaking down that one type of food that they're getting. And so that's where we think it's really beneficial to really diversify the amounts of fiber rich foods in your, or the different types of fiber rich foods in your diet, because that's going to be promoting the growth of a lot of different types of species because each species is going to specialize in breaking down different types of fiber. Yeah, that's really interesting. Where I was going with that is, you know, if I had this number, I'm going to call it a thousand, um, and someone only has 800, how do they get the 200 more in there? Like, do they just sprout or they born or does it, is it carry through with food? Exactly. Like, yeah, it's carried through with all of our environmental influences. So the food we eat is probably the predominant way that we're getting gut bacteria entering into, um, coming in. But it's also, you know, like if you work outdoors, you know, and you're interacting with soil, if you like to get out in the forest, you know, like there's so, it's just all of your environmental influences are going to be contributing to who's growing in your gut. And, so, and what about the people that you're living with and sharing your mm -hmm. environment with? No, that's exactly right. They're also contributing. And so there have been studies showing that, you know, people that live together often share a lot of the same strains of bacteria. Yeah, wow. And you even might share some same strains with your pet. And they've also shown that people like- <laughs> Makes sense because the dogs eat the scraps, don't they? <laughs> so they might be eating the same food, well, not always. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I had something on the tip of my tongue then about this. It'll um, come back. I want to yeah. know, I want to know what are, what are the best weight loss foods from a gut microbiome perspective? What do you think? So really, I think what we can just definitively say from the research right now is just making sure you have those diverse sources of fiber. So as I was saying earlier, you know, we know that when our gut bacteria are breaking down the fiber, they're going to be producing those satiety hormones. And so really, if we want to be promoting that, um, just having as many different sources of foods. And so I'm talking about like whole grains are really important because they're very complex fibers. And so they're ones that are probably going to take longer to be broken down by your gut bacteria. So they have a better chance of going all the way through your colon and actually reaching down 
you know, to the end of your colon. And so when I say whole grains, I'm saying things not just only wheat, but, you know, considering things like quinoa and barley and, and you know, like other grains that maybe aren't as common like millet and sorghum. Um, it's amazing the variety of, of flowers that are now available in, you know, just at Woolies or at Kohl's, you know, you can get tiger nut flour and, you know, brown rice and I mean, just amazing diverse types of grains, which are really wonderful. But then also making sure, you know, you've got your vegetables and your fruits and you're eating the rainbow, you know? So, you know, trying to chop, you know, put in some chickpeas or lentils into salads that you're making. And I mean, beans are a wonderful source of resistant starch, which is really important for feeding those butyrate producing bacteria. And just, you know, all sorts of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds are just, you can't say how great those are for feeding your good guys. I was I did remember what I was going to say when we were talking about the diversity again and I'll I'll also go to the different types of fiber if you can explain that for some people too um is do they do they sort of compete in certain areas the bacteria in parts of it and then when you would talk about you know they get a particular domic because someone has eaten that food and therefore the only way to get rid of them or to increase the diversity is to starve them out or whatever is there like is 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 it complex what happens um within you know the the i guess uh, competing thing? is it always changing depending on what you're yeah. eating no it is um there's been studies that show that your gut microbiome can change within 24 to 48 hours um oh. depending on your diet and so exactly like if you just had a meal that was you know a nice you know really healthy salad with some whole grain bread you're going to be promoting the growth of, you know, of a lot of different types of bacteria, but then maybe for dinner, you just have like a steak and some chocolate cake. And there's not a lot of food there for your gut fat bugs. That's mostly all going to be absorbed by your body. And so your gut bugs are going to end up going on a little bit of a starvation route. So you might start getting more bugs that are good at using like the mucus layer lining your intestines as a fuel source starting to grow up. And there's even a study that was published. It was really fascinating. Um, they did some longitudinal heavy sampling of people over a two week period of time and they found that they could accurately predict the relative abundance of different species of gut bacteria if they knew what the person had eaten the previous three days. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that's, I have actually in my, um, you know, speaking to people always about their, you know, their gut issues, I've actually spoken to quite a few people over the years who've said, my gut was fine and then I went and had a big long Easter weekend or a wedding and they just, they've ruined their gut microbiome seemingly in a weekend just through a really, um, you know, a heavy weekend of just lots of drinking and bad food and just like going, Bleh, and their gut's just gone, what have you done to me? You know, so I think it, yeah, definitely worth knowing that you can do some damage just within a few days. Yeah. Um, do, they attack, do they attack each other? Yeah, some of the gut bugs, I mean, there's definitely active competition between your gut bugs. And actually, our bacteria are actually, a lot of them produce um, what we call, you know, like little antimicrobial peptides. And so these antimicrobial peptides will actually help those bacteria outcompete closely related species. And so it'll basically kill off any closely related species. So they can be the only one there that's going to be able to feed on their fuel source, basically. So the chocolate cake eating bacteria might be saying... I'm going to spit out all this stuff and I'm going to kill you, you broccoli loving fiend, you know, that sort of stuff going on. Yes. And so the chocolate cake bacteria will probably be your mucus degraders because they won't have gotten any food. <laughs> this might help kid, kids eat food of some sort of cartoon style of war going on. That would be really cool. Something they could really understand. And then if you want to add another layer of complexity onto it, there's also this whole emerging area of research on these types of viruses called bacteriophages that only attack bacteria. And they're very specific for specific bacterial species. Wow. And they're also waging a war on the bacteria. So not only do you have your bacteria fighting each other, you've got these viruses attacking the bacteria as well. Wow. And so it is a massive, massive amount of competition and warfare going on there in our guts. And we can help influence that by you know helping eat the right types of fiber to promote those beneficial bugs and give them the leg up so that they can maybe have a better chance do they do they also influence what we want to eat as well, well that's a great question um so there was one study a long oh, a couple years ago that was in fruit flies that suggested that at least in fruit flies the gut bacteria may be influencing the choice of food in fruit flies however 
humans are a far cry from fruit flies. And so um, I, I haven't seen anything that's been done in any animal model closer to humans yet. You know, I'm just trying to put it together. So, you know, someone says, I can't stop eating chocolate cake. I'm just craving it and it's, I'm getting stressed if I don't eat some chocolate cake and I've got to eat it. And as soon as I eat it, I feel better. And the chocolate cake bugs are saying, yeah, that's it, feed us. And we'll keep pushing all the broccoli lovers out of the way <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's like, I want to change, but I can't because well, I'm Probably stuck. more having to do with the way your brain is wired as opposed to what your gut bugs are doing. Yeah. Point. yeah. When you're eating that chocolate cake, that's a huge influx of glucose into your blood system which is activating all these receptors and that's creating that dopamine response in your brain to say, oh yes, this is making me really happy. And so we just keep craving that, you know, that dope, that dopamine response. And that's the problem is, yeah, it's, you know, we do have different pathways that get activated, but um, at this point we haven't seen any evidence that the gut bugs are actually influencing our food choices yet. Yeah. Okay. And what about uh, different gut bugs that are common in a result of weight gain is there any sort of culprits in that realm? the biggest yeah one of the biggest the worst foods that influence our gut microbiome negatively to make us gain weight what what do you know so far so the only thing that i can say so far about negative foods is the fact that um one of the pro-inflammatory substances our gut bugs can produce is something called lipopolysaccharides and we do know that when we eat diets that are high in fat and especially saturated fat that actually allows these lipopolysaccharides to escape our gut and cross over and enter into our lymph and into our blood circulation. And then when they're in our blood circulation, anytime they encounter an immune cell, they can start triggering inflammation. And so a lot of the disease models out there right now that have links to the gut microbiome actually suspect that it's this lipopolysaccharide that's probably one of the main culprits is because um, when people have an unhealthy diet, you get more of those lipopolysaccharides escaping the gut and entering into our blood circulation where they can just be causing that low-grade chronic inflammation. Um, another thing that we've been seeing in research is alcohol. Alcohol can actually really negatively impact our intestinal permeability. It can actually increase the permeability of our intestines or help exacerbate what we call, some people call leaky gut. And that can also help those pro-inflammatory substances like lipopolysaccharides escape the gut and enter into our blood circulation. And so, you know, it's kind of what we already know, you know, again, where, you know, having, you know, diets that have excessive amounts of fat or excessive amounts of alcohol are probably not going to be helping us very much. And again, having diets that lack fiber is the biggest culprit of all, because we know fiber is playing such an integral role in maintaining a healthy gut. So can fiber be a protective thing if you've, if you've got someone who's eating way too much saturated fat and drinking a lot if you're going to increase their fiber and their fiber diversity is that going to have a protective effect or you've got to get rid of the the alcohol and the saturated fat is does it does it help um to mitigate those effects um i haven't seen any conclusive studies on that but i can't help but think that yes it would definitely help to mitigate those effects because if we're feeding our gut bugs those fiber rich sources of food, that means that they will be producing, you know, those beneficial short chain fatty acids. And so at least there's going to be some counteraction. Um, you know, if you're producing more anti-inflammatory substances, that's going to have at least a counteractive effect against pro-inflammatory substances being produced. Um, help with that benefit, gut lining a little bit. Exactly. And another beneficial thing is typically, you know, if you start increasing one food, like more adding more fiber rich sources of food into your diet usually that means you're going to be decreasing other um, food sources yeah. and so maybe by having framing it as trying to get people to increase the number of different fiber sources in their diet without even thinking about it they might start reducing the amount of fat in their diet crowding out let's, let's cram exactly. as much good stuff in and eventually there's no room for the bad exactly. <laughs> so you, we mentioned fiber diversity is that there's types of fiber isn't there you mentioned resistant starch and then there's this, what, what are some of the categories and that fibers fall under? Yeah, so there's this term that's been um, developed and that's been used quite a bit called prebiotics. And um, these are basically called, these are basically defined as non-digestible compounds that basically uh, promote the growth of beneficial bacteria in our gut. 
And so we have what we call prebiotic fibers. And so one of them is resistant starch. Um, another one, these all have really long names. There's fructooligosaccharides, there's the lactooligosaccharides, there's things called arabinoxalin, there's something called inulin. Um, there's, there's a huge number of these different types of fiber. But basically what it all boils down to is um, fiber is a carbohydrate and which is basically just a bunch of glucose linked together by different chemical bonds. And depending on what those chemical bonds are, you're going to have different, um, it's gonna be classified into different types of fiber. And so like our body has specific enzymes to break down specific types of chemical bonds linking sugar molecules, but there's more complex bonds that they can't break down. And that's where our gut bacteria come in. And so they just have this huge array of enzymes they can produce that can break down almost any type of chemical bond you can imagine. That might have been a little bit too deep, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was um, yeah, good. It answered my question really well. So what about, um, what about at birth? Like, are we born with a full microbiome? Is that how it starts? Is, does mum give us a full microbiome uh, or are we born with it? Or is it, we well, accumulate is, is, it? Is there a microbiome surrounding us when we're in utero? What's the science sort of yeah. saying? No, it's changing a lot, yeah? It is, it is. No, that's a great question. So earlier, um, actually, if you just asked me this six months ago, I would have said, yes, there's like this in utero microbiome because studies have suggested that there is what they call a placental microbiome that is responsible for the early seeding of gut bacteria into the baby. However, just about a month or two ago, a new study came out that's supposed to be like the conclusive study to answer the question. And they, it was a very large scale. And they actually found that what we originally had thought was a placental microbiome was actually just a result of contamination by different reagents used to process the sample. Wow. And so the reason that was an issue is because when you have like communities that are really lowly, like very low abundant communities where, you know, like you consider like your urine, your blood, where typically you don't expect to find many bacteria, it's really hard to differentiate what's just contamination that's on in your reagents or on your laboratory tools versus what's actually in the source that you're measuring. Like when we look at stool, we don't have to worry about that because 99% of stool is bacterial DNA. But when you look at these well abundant communities, it's really hard to tell. So anyways, um, basically now it seems that there is no microbiome in infants when they're first born. Their first exposure to microbes is their mode of birth. And so we do tend to see that like in infants born via C-section, they have more skin associated microbes versus infants born vaginally, they have more lactobacilli and more vaginal related bacteria seeding their gut. So I wonder if there's practices now that are taken up uh, with C-section uh, that, you know, to try to promote healthy microbiome or give the baby a start from the beginning. I'm sure that, is that, is that something that they're doing now? I think there's some initial, you know, there's some trials and there's talk about it, but I don't think there's anything that's been large scale recommended or implemented what's your knowledge on that yeah it's about the same there have been there are trials underway right now um but nothing definitive has come out in terms of recommendations yet from those so it's still an active area of research and with those the kids that are i guess you know if you're a mom you just want the best for your baby's development if you've gone oh no you know my baby's been born via cesarean i really wanted the you know the vaginal delivery so that we could seed the microbiome what do you see you know do you see that there's a long-term uh patterns like i mean the stool samples that you're getting in i would imagine you get some coming in from children who've um you know, been born via C-section, they may have had, you know, lots of courses of antibiotics. Do you see a big difference in, you know, sort of samples from kids that may have had that different start in life? And is it an ongoing thing? Can you fix it? Can you help? You know, is there things you can do? Yeah, so there has been research on this area. Um, interestingly, yeah, they do show that, I mean, there's a lot of factors that can influence a child's gut microbiome and, you know, your mode of birth is just one of them. Um, other really big factors are going to be, you know, whether you're breastfeeding versus formula feeding, but what they're actually seeing now is what's actually trumping all of that. And which, which is making, you know, maybe mode of birth and stuff, not so important is actually whether or not those kids were given antibiotics, um, early in life. 
And so there's a, several studies coming out now showing that have like basically followed um, mothers and their children from birth all the way up to, I think it's 10 years of age now um, yeah. in some of the birth cohorts. And they've actually shown that children that were given antibiotics early in life, usually within the first two years, um, they are more prone. They're at a higher risk of developing obesity and autoimmune conditions such as food allergies and asthma compared to children that were not given antibiotics. And a lot of the reasoning behind that is because, you know, that especially that first six months of life is when our immune system is being trained on how to respond to, you know, different bacteria and microbes and foreign influences. And so the gut bacteria um, play a huge role in helping train that immune system and helping it recognize, you know, what needs to be an inflammatory response versus what is okay. And if we wipe out all those gut bacteria, um, that has been shown to be playing a huge role in how that early training occurs then. And so then maybe our immune system isn't quite as good at recognizing what it needs to be responding to with an inflammatory response versus not. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I guess sometimes the antibiotics are, are required and- Totally life-saving in many cases, but yeah, it's just like um, you've got, I think we've, we've, we've come from three generations of just, in Australia anyway, constant antibiotic overuse massively. And yeah, we're seeing lots and lots of, um, yeah, bad effects from that. I think we've finally woken up and realized that we can't keep doing this, but yeah, it's like, what are the, can we bounce back, do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, this is a good thing, is it? Now that this has been identified, now there's something, you know, now there's something we can work towards um, doing about it. And so there's active research trying to determine, you know, like, what kind of probiotics can we be feeding infants, you know, that have had antibiotics to help them reseed their microbiome quickly? You know, like they've already shown that in um, like preemie births that, you know, providing pr um, probiotics to um, preemie children is actually, you know, really helping improve their survival and future development. And so, I mean, there's a lot of research going to this area and I'm sure within the, you know, the next five to 10 years, we're gonna start seeing a lot of solutions coming out to help, you know, when, I mean, obviously there's gonna be times when you have to have antibiotics given to your children, you don't have a choice. And so hopefully we'll start to see those solutions coming out of the market then, okay, here's what you can do if you've had to give your child antibiotics, prevent downstream effects. Is there anything that the research is backing that we can do at the moment? So for example, oh my goodness, the child's really sick, they've got to have antibiotics. Okay, they've had their course of antibiotics. Or, you know, is there anything before, like, so during and after that is scientifically proven to be beneficial to help them to bounce back to a more normal microbiome? I think that's still a very emerging area of research. And so I haven't seen anything myself, but I also haven't dug in super deep into that literature. And so there could be studies that have come out recently that have found something. But um, as far as I know so far, I haven't seen anything that's really conclusive yet. Yeah, you'd imagine it's like it's 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 obvious if if you're depleting some of the the microbiome through trying to kill a virus or disease or whatever it might be, is to straight away start with some fiber diversity and get some healthy bugs back in with probiotics and stuff like. Surely that's. Uh, like, yeah, I think I guess what whatever grows back post the antibiotics, you've just got to be really careful with the the foods that you're feeding in post antibiotic use yeah yeah definitely i'm sure and there was an interesting study in um children actually in young children that were showing that um or actually it was just right when you were weaning the child um onto solid food and it was just showing that it is actually quite important to start introducing some more of those fiber rich foods um i think it's young i can't, okay don't quote me on the age but i don't want anybody to take that advice and have it be wrong but it they did cite like showing that it was beneficial to start weeding them onto some of these solid fiber rich foods um earlier than later because that did stimulate the production of more of those butyrate producing microbes and those were found to be associated with better health outcomes later in life yeah mm -hmm. really cool well, it's uh, we could talk for hours. I, um, I don't know if you've got any sort of something final, Lena. That's your that. Uh, what's 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 the most exciting thing you've read recently? Can you think? <laughs> um, actually, I did want to do in this one little plug. So this is usually I hate my studies because they don't always really translate to humans. But this was a really good, compelling one. It came out just a couple weeks ago, and it actually showed um, they're talking about like actually recovery from antibiotics. 
Yeah. And, you know, like one of the big questions is, you know, like, how do you get your gut microbiota to recover faster after antibiotics? And they actually found they fed mice um, a fiber rich diet and a fiber poor diet. And they found that the mice on the fiber poor diet, that the antibiotics actually um, exacerbated the, the dysbiosis that occurred, like the basically the collapse of the microbiome. And it inhibited the recovery of the gut microbiome and that the mice that were fed the high fiber diet had a much faster recovery of their gut microbiome. And then they also found that, you know, raising mice in isolation was also inhibiting recovery and that, you know, having, um, being exposed to more environmental influences is likely going to be beneficial towards getting your microbiome to bounce back. So anyways, it's really nice just to see, again, that we have so many studies coming out in the gut microbiome and they're always converging on the same answer is that diverse sources of fiber are just so important for maintaining that healthy gut microbiome. And now even, you know, bouncing back from antibiotic use, it looks like um, having, maintaining that fiber rich diet is also going to be incredibly beneficial. And it's, it, I guess it's one of the main problems with our current, you know, modern Western diet is because we've just gone, yeah, we love all this white refined food just, and we've just stripped away so much of the fiber and so much of that, you know, we're just left with this processed white gunk a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really nice to see that it's pointing to, we've got to stop processing our food so much. Exactly. And just mm -hmm. going back to basics, you know, just having those whole grains, having those beans and those legumes and those fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds in our diet. I mean, the whole package. <laughs> exactly. But there's so many wonderful foods to choose from, you know? And so, you know, most everybody can usually find something that they like in there and we'll employ lots of different types of combinations. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's uh, I can see the passion when you're talking about the research and the studies and, you know, um, I don't think you're at your pinnacle yet. I think there's still, there, there's, there's more to come. There's, um, and uh, what would you like to see? I, I've got one question. What would you like to see? You know, is there, is there a, oh, I don't know. You know, everyone talks about they're looking for that magic and you know, you're saying it's so simple fruit and veggies, but people are so time poor and they've got to trust manufacturers and the food is really food and all that sort of stuff. Like, would you like to see people just, you know, making food in their own backyards or you know is there a uh, particular analysis report that you can tell people exactly they have to eat this this and this and this and they're going to restore like where's it going what's the what, what is there something there that you think wow that would be amazing if we could find this out or de de deliver this special report yeah i mean it, it's you know i hate to say it but i think a lot of what we're seeing it's already there it's just you know eating those different sources of fiber i think the key is really going to actually end up being how can we get people that are time poor to actually start investing in figuring out how to have more nutritional food in their daily diet because i mean we get it it's really hard to you know you come home from work you're exhausted it's a lot easier to go to macros and pick up you know, a quick meal as opposed to preparing something at home, you know? And so hopefully I really see my dream would be to have education about this whole area, you know, being readily available to everybody, having this be something that everybody is going to eventually just know as a matter of fact, that of course we need to be eating these healthy foods for a healthy gut microbiome. And then hopefully that's going to spur a change in the foods that are available for us. So instead of seeing macros and hungry jacks on every corner, maybe we're going to be able to start seeing some more healthy choices popping up, like healthy fast food choices that, you know, are predominantly whole foods as opposed to processed foods. I think it's happening. I think it's already happening. I think we're starting to see all these, um, you know, the, the, the let's make, easy easy kits for you know people to prepare food at home it's it's already starting to happen a healthy ready-made meals yeah, and stuff it's, like that it's happening but lots it's of just, diversity and like, like just hasn't, talk about it the hasn't rainbow. hit the real mainstream yet but it's definitely getting there quickly now yes and so hopefully we're just going to see that ramping up even more in the next few years so that soon it's going to be easy for people to choose to eat healthy instead of it actually being a lot of work to try to find healthy food yeah and i think that people have been so conditioned towards yeah, that's normal. That's there. I'm going to grab one of those where mm -hmm. it, that should become less normal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. So if people want to find more, I mean, we have a lot of people that watch uh, our episodes, whether they're practitioners, health enthusiasts, or people that with some troubled bellies looking for a little bit of help. How do they keep following you guys and, uh, you know, keeping up to date with what's happening and, and the research? You know, is there a, have you guys got a newsletter that people can subscribe to and a blog? I know there's a blog on the website, yeah? Yep, yep, all of the above. So um, probably the easiest way is just to go to www.microba.com. And we've got blogs. Um, if you go up to the very top, we've got a little toolbar. We've got a link to blogs that we've written in this area. We also have links to some of the latest science news that's coming out. So links to both the academic journal articles as well as some of the science digests that translate those journal articles into more non-technical language. So it's easier to understand. We do also have a newsletter you can sign up for. And recently we've even launched kind of a little primer gut course for just the layman you know if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about this area you can sign up for this free course and it consists of, i think of about five emails that you'll get over about a week or two wow, awesome that's really cool. so good well thank you i really appreciate your time we do here at eat play poo and i'm sure everyone watching has got a lot out of it and um we uh hope to cross paths again soon at definitely some point. thanks so much alana you're welcome thank you thank you all right so super interesting, hey? The, um, the gut microbiome and, and cultivating a healthy gut may be a little bit simpler than what a lot of people think it is. The answers are there for what to do, what not to do. And a lot of it is our grandparents knew, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the grandparents, just old school stuff, just, you know, diverse food, feeding diverse microbes. Yeah. Doing a diverse get out, range get of Get out health. in nature, hang out with healthy people. Get dirty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's um, fascinating um, how simple it might might just be the answer. We've just become so so out of touch and so warped by our our modern lifestyle and our big food manufacturers, big pharma, all of that sort of stuff has kind of really gotten in the way of what should be easy. Mm. Well, thank you very much, everyone watching. Um, uh, and uh, you can find more about Microba at their website. Uh, do a couple of courses, follow the blogs. And of course, um, at Good Mix, we've got our own blog there with uh, Jeannie uh, writing uh, monthly blogs. So yeah, ask any questions. If you've got any questions about this, this episode, then put a comment down below um, or send us an email. And um, yeah, we'll see if we can get an expert to, to give their opinion on that for you. So from all of us at Good Mix and Eat Play Poo, it's goodbye. See ya. See you guys. Bye.